And Dr. Williams, tell us a little bit about your background. I understand that you are a certified, board certified um, counselor. Correct, yes. And tell me more about yourself. Yeah, so I professionally, um, I received my master's from the University of Georgia and went on to complete my doctorate in counseling and counselor education, which has an emphasis in both the practice of counseling and teaching. So I, I received my doctorate at uh, Georgia State University and went on to both practice and teach for the past, taught for nine years, um, been in practice for 20 years. My daughter who lives in St. Louis, uh, and she's a nurse. She sent me a recent article that you had written, the title of which I believe is called uh, Managing Fear and Anxiety in a Health Pandemic. Is that right? That's correct. That's and correct. it really struck me, and that's why I reached out to you. And I'd love to have you talk to us about this article. What prompted you to write this article? Who were you writing it for? And how can we uh, begin to enrich this conversation that we're having for our listeners? Have been in practice, as I mentioned, for nearly 20 years. And what struck me just last week, and as I'm talking, I'm like, wow, what a difference a week makes, right? Um, just last week, I was seeing my normal six to eight clients per day in my office certainly paying attention to what was happening, um, but still sort of adopting kind of like a wait and see attitude about everything in regards to moving my practice to more distance um, counseling. So more and more, my, my clients were asking me directly, so what do you think about this, Dr. Williams? Like, what do you think is, is happening? Do you think we're doing enough as a country? Look what's happening in Italy and in, in China. So the conversations were initially pretty broad. And then the conversations became more, um, let's say, localized, right? Mm -hmm. My kids' school district just closed because a substitute teacher actually um, had contracted the virus and the entire school district shut down. So people were very confused and became very worried. Um, and the discussions just got a little bit more personal and, and quite localized. So let's talk about some of the families and the different groups of people who are impacted by this and what uh, tips and advice and words of comfort you can give them. Let's first talk about uh, the family that is home with school-aged children yeah. and perhaps the mom and or dad are home and they've got to work from home. And so yeah. you have uh, a family that is in the house, maybe the first day is a vacation, but by the time you get to the seventh day, it's not a vacation anymore. No, no. And we as humans don't tend to do really well with, with change, especially unexpected change. And so you have a couple of different things going on, right? In that scenario, Joe, you've got parents who are either just home or working from home, which is a new experience. And you have kids who are typically in school. So um, depending on the child, and I, and I tell family, families this all the time, this disruption may be just a disruption to the child, especially if it's a younger child and they see this as maybe a vacation and just um, a lovely way to sort of spend their day, not being overly, um, uh, it, it, there's not a whole lot of structure. So younger kids tend to kind of do well with that. Um, so it might just be simply a disruption. But Joe, for older kids and, and for parents, especially if they're impacted economically, if they're no longer working their same number of hours, and you and I both know that so many families in this country live paycheck to paycheck, right? That sort of goes into more so the crisis mode not just a disruption, this feels like a crisis. And change is one thing, change tends to be more transactional. Here's a new policy, here's a new way of doing things. Uh, transition, Joe, tends to be more psychological. So it can cause stress, especially for families who are now juggling a couple of things. They are parenting, they are teaching, they're monitoring. If you have more than one child, 
who is in um, taking classes from a couple of different, you know, grade levels, it, it's very taxing. And so it is really, really common to hear families now and you see it all over social media. And I'm certainly seeing it in my practice that are experiencing a great deal of stress. Um, so in terms of words of, wis words of wisdom, the first thing that comes to mind is just reminding families and caregivers and grandparents, um, anyone that is taking care of uh, young children and also sort of managing their own anxiety and stress during this time. The most important thing I wanna share is this is temporary. This is temporary. Sure, we have no idea um, where the road is really eventually going to lead, right? This could be part of our new normal, but I like to really uh, suggest to my clients to take every day as it comes and be in the here and the now, be as present as possible um, because that moment comes and goes, right? So we are gonna experience something, we're just not sure what that is. And so sort of embracing where we are right now, understanding that this is temporary, we're gonna figure something out. Um, it may not be ideal, it may not be, uh, aligned on our pre aligned with our preset timetable, but this is temporary. And with that being said, um, especially for families who are raising young children, um, stability is really, really important. And predictability is really important, especially amidst a, a, a crisis or a life transition. So as much as is within your control, keep the bedtime routine the same, right? If you have dinner at a certain time, have dinner at that same time. Um, minimize the other disruptions that could happen in the home for your kids as much as possible. And that's not only good for, for your children, that's also good for your mental health and well-being. If you get up and go to the gym in the morning, I'm someone that does that, my gym announced that they were closing two days ago. I was like, ah, and my husband said, we do have outside. <laughs> we have a whole, whole area in the front and backyard and you have the neighborhood. And guess what? That's exactly what I did. And it felt good. So the location, um, the entity, the building may look different. Um, movement is is really good for you and maintaining routines as much as possible it may not look exactly the same um, but doing your best will help to sort of minimize the stress and the chaos within the home environment you know one of the things that uh, we've seen uh, both at the national and, and local levels are words of caution about hoarding you know people's anxiety and their their fears sometimes get the best of them and they think that they'll never get a chance to get back out to the supermarket. Right. What are your thoughts and, and words to the, our listeners who have to overcome that compulsion to want to go out and, and get a year's worth of toilet paper, for example? <laughs> right. So, um, you know, I, 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 I have a couple of different thoughts about that. The first thing is I think it's helpful to um, see the toilet paper as, as symbolic of taking care of our basic needs, right? It seems so silly and goofy and people really don't understand it. But for those individuals who feel the need to stockpile and um, purchase 100 rolls of toilet paper at a time, it, it is speaking to a fear that is irrational right? It is irrational, but that logical part of your brain is actually turned off when your amygdala, which is the fear center, your emotional center, when that thing, it's like the alarm, when that thing goes off, logic and uh, problem solving kind of goes away, right? So um, I understand those individuals who feel the need to hoard. I know where that's coming from. It's a way of making sense of everything that's going on in the midst of chaos. It's a way of finding some sense of control when really internally you feel completely out of control. Um, but it is something that I will say does sort of level off with time. It's sort of like the initial reaction to, oh my gosh, what's happening? I don't understand this. Um, and then over time people do uh, 
get calmer and that part of the brain that understands that, okay, this is not the most important thing right now, that will start to um, take over. And then the other side, Joe, the folks, that, <laughs> those of us who maybe aren't hoarding the toilet paper, I do think it's important to um, just express compassion for those um, that are in the grocery store, sort of taking everything off the shelves, because it really is um, an automatic reaction to, to uh, that's really related to fear and need for control. In our state, uh, one of our large grocery um, supermarket chains has implemented what we now affectionately refer to as boomer hour. That is giving <laughs> those seniors 60 years of age and older yeah. an opportunity to come into the market, uh, in shop uh, yeah. without having to mix and mingle with the younger uh, yes. generation. Yes, and I just, and I, I love that. And I, I, I know that stores now are implementing um, uh, item limits in terms of like purchasing. That's so important uh, because what you're stockpiling, that means that there's not enough maybe for that elderly um, community member of ours. Um, and and what's, what's nice, you know, just to kind of, piggyback on what you were saying, is in the midst of the chaos and the fear and the hoarding uh, paper supplies, we're also hearing lots of stories of, um, of just where humanity, the best part of humanity is on display. I was on a call not too long ago where a friend shared that um, she went to a grocery store and she saw some elderly um, uh, individuals outside of the grocery store asking people if they could hear, here's $80, could you please purchase something? And just that level of trust and sweetness and people were like, absolutely, you don't have to go in here. I'm going to go and take care of whatever it is that you need. And I thought that that was really lovely. And so we are seeing that as well. There's one a group of people that I'm very concerned about. Those are the individuals who are in various stages of self-recovery, mm. uh, whether it's from you know one substance or another, their routine, their opportunity to go into the, the rooms, I, as it's called, yeah. uh, may not be there. What kind of coping skills can they use while they are sheltering at home, for example, and not relapse. Yeah, that's really, really important. I'm so glad that you brought that up. Um, this crisis is impacting us on so many levels. And clearly, we, we're, we've talked about the schools, the school systems. Um, our government is impacted. Our leaders are feverishly trying to figure out what's going on. Um, but as a member of the mental health uh, community, we're seeing real impact in terms of um, our most vulnerable uh, community members who are struggling with their mental, their mental health. And addiction is so real and so, shall we say, fragile. Recovery, the recovery process. And um, I worked at a psychiatric hospital. The primary modality is group therapy at that particular hospital, and, and that is the approach that so many treatment centers uh, utilize because of the power of connection and connecting with other people. And we're now hearing terms such as social distancing, which for folks like me is a scary term. That's scarier than the virus, right? Because my soul needs to be connected with you. And, and with other people and how then do we do that and how then do we treat our most vulnerable um, members of, of our society. So what I'm seeing now, um, which is so wonderful, is there just being flexibility and creativity in terms of the way that we deliver services, Joe. Um, as I mentioned, I've been doing um, strictly online uh, video conferencing sessions, um, some telephone sessions as well. And I am not currently running groups, but I'm a huge fan of group work. And I know that um, a lot of my colleagues who are working in addiction and treatment centers are using different video conferencing platforms, such as Zoom is one in particular, to be able to run online groups. So there are lots of um, conversations about that because it's, it, and, and, and how do we deal with confidentiality and how do we deal with when there's a lag in terms, you know, we're really having to figure it out. And by the way, I think that's a good thing because I think there's going to be um, 
uh, we don't know what the future holds. And so to have this as, a, as an option, um, especially when we know that there is a real shortage of mental health professionals across this country, especially in rural areas, I think it's really good for all of us um, in, in the healthcare profession to be uh, to educate ourselves on different ways of delivering services, especially during the pandemic. In the limited amount of time that we have left, what else would you like to share with our listeners? Yeah, I think, um, and Joe, you and I talked about this a little bit um, briefly during our call. I really see this time as an opportunity uh, for us as Americans, for us globally, for us as just human beings, um, certainly there is real impact. And you and I can talk about that ad nauseum, the economic impact, the psychological impact. People are really scared um, right now. And we want to validate that. That is a real emotion. And especially when you're raising kids, you want to encourage the expression of all emotions. All emotions are valid. And there's an opportunity right now for us to show kindness, for us to display um, joy in the midst of the storm. Yeah, there's a plaque in my office that, that pretty much says, how can we dance in the rain? Right, and that it, does, it seems like an oxymoron. I don't want to dance in the storm. I want to kind of hunker down, and um, and 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 that's the tendency is to be really self-focused during times of distress, um, and hyper-focused on our needs and the needs of our immediate family members. Hence the toilet paper, <laughs> right? But how can we go against the grain? How can we sort? Of act opposite of, of what our fear is telling us to do. How can we connect with others? So social distancing doesn't mean social disconnection. Um, and, and how can we live that out within our families first, because I believe our family is our first ministry. How do we live that out in terms of our neighbors, our community members, and in the world? Technology is an amazing thing. And um, now it's become less of a luxury and more of a necessity in terms of our daily life. So then how do we stay connected with grandma? Okay, grandma's 85. I can't visit her and I can't give her a hug. Um, but can I send some, you know, can I send instructions on how to do FaceTime and how to like log on to Zoom and just let her know that I'm thinking of her and I miss her and I love her? Can I send a joke? Um, are we able to play more board games, which seems to be a lost art? <laughs> can we, <laughs> can we um, just take a walk and smile and greet our neighbors? Uh, so that's, that's really what I want to leave your um, listeners and viewing audience is um, this hurts right now. Um, this is temporary. And what are the opportunities to show more kindness, to express more gratitude, and to stay more connected. Dr. Chen Wei Williams, I want to thank you so much for taking the time with us today to share your, mm -hmm. your words of wisdom, your experience, your perspective, which we hope our listeners and viewers will be able to find something that they can take away from it. I hope so. And thank you so much for um, inviting me uh, and, and giving me this opportunity, Joe. I appreciate it. And we look forward to perhaps visiting with you again. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Is it okay if I leave my website? Absolutely. Please go ahead. I have information on my website about um, anxiety and dealing with trauma and my latest blogs um, because we're all in transition. Uh, my website is www.meaningfulsolutionscounseling.com. We'll be sure to put that in the graphic as well. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> Take care. Stay Thank healthy. You. Thank you. You as well. I know. Yeah.